the hell that I was in, I'd do anything to be better. I thought like a lunatic. You kind of just have like that little bit of hope that it will get better. You're gonna make it. This began my surrender. I am a witness of my own growth. It's a life beyond your wildest dreams, and I just have to say, it works if you work it. My story, that's what I share. You're listening to Far From Finished, a weekly podcast where we share new, real-life stories of hope and triumph, told by the people who live them. Part two of this real-life experience in recovery. PKD is an acronym for polycystic kidney disease. Polycystic kidney disease, it, I, how I would describe it as a patient and as a, a layperson in that, it's uh, when your uh, kidneys are, uh, are essentially colonized by cysts. And, and this is generally a, um, a hereditary genetic disease Mine was handed down to me through my mother. So my experience with this is actually through my mother, who back in 1969, when I was five years old, um, she went into kidney failure, and she was um, predicted to die. And I was put on the telephone with her and um, uh, to say goodbye to her. But miraculously, there was a technology that just came on the market, and it was called a dialysis machine. So what they could do is, although her she was in kidney failure, which I learned is called renal failure, and that's what polycystic kidney does. Eventually, with the colonization of your kidneys, it takes over the actual function. So there comes a time where your kidneys will not filter toxins anymore, and your body becomes so toxic that obviously it takes your life. So she, so she had to go on a dialysis to every three days for five hours a day, uh, get her blood basically cleaned out through a machine. So they literally hooked her up to a machine and ran all the, body, the blood up out, of, out of her body into a machine. It filtered it and put it back in her body, which is really hard on your body to, be, you know, to go through that process every three days for five hours. How I discovered, it, it was a very interesting story. Um... So it was a series of events that, that happened back in 2002. And one of the, one of the major events occurred uh, was that my sister, one year older than me, went into um, kidney failure and went directly on a dialysis machine. So her kidneys failed, no notice, she's on dialysis the next day. So what that did was that triggered me in my brain about my mother, because I, I when I was five years old, so I lived from five years old to 18 years old when my mother passed away. So that, that triggered every memory of me getting up at 4.30 in the morning with her, waiting for her, the van, to, to pick her up to take her to dialysis three days a week. I lived like this. So the only thing I could think of at that time was, oh, my God, my sister got this. That means I'm, there's, a, there's, a, there's a, a high probability that I'm going to have this. But I was like, you know what? I, I, I may be okay. I mean, I'm in shape. I'm, I'm taking, taking care of myself. Right, and uh, you know, I've been drinking my cranberry juice. I should be fine, but all, but all of a sudden, my older sister calls me and says she went and got checked out, and she has it. And then you know, I'm getting a little more nervous, and so then next thing you know, my brother calls me and he said, "Yeah, he has it." And then my sister, my older sister, uh, she um, she calls me and she said she had a kid check, and all three of her children have it. So I said to myself, uh, "I better go get checked out," and I did. So. I went, I went and got checked out. So they ran a urine test on me. Fine. They did a blood test. I am fine. So I'm just really glad, I'm really glad because it was just, you know, just, just a nightmare of me thinking about that I, you know, have this thing that my mother dealt with. It, it was really scary and it was unnerving. But I said to myself, you may, I better go get a, maybe, is there anything else I'm going to do? Yeah, go get an ultrasound. So I went to uh, Steinberg's Diagnostics. And, I, and I'm laying on a table with gel on my stomach. And um, the lady is, uh, she's running this little handheld machine on my, on my abdomen where my kidneys are. <clears throat> and so by the, by the expression on her face, I knew I had it at that moment. And she didn't say anything because she got really quiet. So she couldn't tell me anything. So I, ha I would have to wait two weeks and, um, and go to what was called, and I know today, a nephrologist. 
And that's what a kidney doctor is. I only knew kidney doctor all my life. My mother's going to the kidney machine, and she had a kidney doctor. Now I knew this new word called nephrologist. And she said, yes, you, 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 have, you have polycystic kidney disease. And so what he does, he hands me this little pill. It's a low dosage of high blood pressure medication just so I won't get high blood pressure, although I didn't have it. So that's just the medication they give you. Because I found out that day it's not curable and it's called what's called chronic. So that means over time it would take over the functionality of my kidney. So, you know, that's the age of the internet. The internet's around. So I go home and I just put in polycystic kidney disease. I, Google wasn't even around yet. And anyway, it came up. It said polycystic kidney disease. So it said, you've been given a gift that you didn't ask for and that you can't give back. That was the first sentence of polycystic kidney disease that I read. And right then and there, I went into, I will call a depression for two weeks. And for the next two weeks, all I could think about was my mother on that machine every day. I'm driving around Las Vegas and I'm seeing DeVita building signs. And I know what that means. That means kidney machine. Because that's what they do. So every time I see DeVita, every time I think of my mother, all I can think, all I can, all I can imagine is myself hook up to a machine and my life declining. And I can, and I only know what that machine did to my mother because it debilitated her whole body. My mother died at 46 years old, and she looked like she was 76 years old. That's what it did to her body. She was not even walking. So, um, so that day, when, when I discovered it in 2002, it absolutely um, was a game changer for me. And, um, you know, over time, you know, I didn't, like, for example, what's really interesting is I had no outside symptoms. When you, when you, even today, when people look at me, look, I look fine. I look absolutely normal. But, uh, but if you were with me uh, last week when I was getting ultra, another ultrasound, well, my kidneys have enlarged. They are super big now. And um, I have what is called innumerable cysts. So they can't count. I have so many cysts, you can't even count how many I have. Right? And so what it is, again, the function. So you as a, a, a healthy human being have what is called normal function kidneys. They would be functioning at about 100%. Mine are functioning about 18%. So that's a big dramatic difference. Um, so you can see, and that decline happens over time. So, um, so again, when I was diagnosed and I went through that, you know, that psychological adjustment, and I had to realize, and I just started living life one day at a time, and um, I just had to accept the fact this is, I've been given a gift I didn't ask for. And, I, and, and the thing is, I can't even give it back. So that's that's my deal. That's what that, that's that's what I've been living with, and I have to tell you that I live with it in secret for uh, uh, since two thousand two and since seventeen. So that's fifteen years. I basically lived in secret. I let a few people know about it, but the shame and the stigma was based off of my childhood experience with my mother, because prior to that, my mother was a very healthy person who, although not educated, she did work. Ma granted, it was menial labor, but she worked. And we did pretty good, all right? And uh, when, when she got sick, dad wasn't there anymore. And now, you know, she used to get paid every, every Friday. And, and now, um, now we're living on government assistance once a month. And, um, and that had this whole different animal there. And so, um, and, and, and those are the things that I remember. That's what I equated um, polycystic kidney disease would do to me. It would debilitate my body. I would slowly decline. But, you know, I have since learned that, you know, there are things that can actually be done. That I don't have to die prematurely. That I have actual medical options. So, um, and, and, and I, I was educated, um, you know, through my doctor about what those options would, would be like and how that would actually impact my life. That disease, actually, I was born with, right? So, and since, since it's a chronic disease, and typically it doesn't actually show or rear its head until your 30s, like well in your 30s. And when I discovered it, I was actually in my early 40s. And that's when I actually discovered it.
it was hereditary. So there wasn't anything in my behavior that con contributed to it, right? So I, I often thought about that, but no, I actually had it, right? Did it, did it, did it, did it, did it full court press it or did it exacerbate it? No, that, that, that is not the case there. So um, that was, uh, again, uh, genetically, uh, this was passed to me. And like, for example, um, and my kids could theoretically have it. Uh, my, my, my sister, for example, she's never, um, and this is, this is really good for good parallel. I have a sister who is five years older than me, but that means it's been in her body longer. And uh, if my function level today and her function level is the same thing. She's never done anything. Mm -hmm. Right? So that, that even gives me more evidence that it's two separate things right there. So the thing about this is that um, this disease, you can't eat healthy enough. You can't exercise in a way. It's a chronic, debilitating disease, again, that cysts literally colonize and take over the actual function of your kidneys. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the good things about it is because of the fact that I don't, I am not diabetic, and the fact that I don't have high blood pressure, you know, it gives me, it gives me options. So, and that's what I was going to inform the by a doctor, to let you know that the, one of the options that I'm looking at is, is actually a, a, a good fit for it. It's like, it's like shame having two sides. So, in one, in one way, uh, when I think about the um, polycystic kidney disease, so there's a prejudice and there's a stigma around what we call, um, um, when people have um, existing medical conditions and they try to go to work and get employment, or they try to obtain life insurance, or they try to obtain medical insurance. So the stigma is that you will, you will be denied coverage for pre-existing. So if you look at our healthcare system, it's about pre-existing conditions. So, if I go get a job and I disclose it, I cannot get a, I, I'm, I'm considered a liability, a paper that a chronic condition, right? So I could be a liability to healthcare, I could be a liability to the employer, that type of thing, right? So, and then also, I mean, I need a job. So, I mean, these are things I learned on the PDK website, the prejudice that's against it. So immediately, that's going to put me in shame because I don't want to be put in a situation where I can't work now. Because like, I've always been independent, I've always been a worker, I don't want to rely on public assistance. That's just characteristically, that's just not who I am. So that in itself scared me and it brought a lot of shame. When I think about, when I think about recovery today, you know, one of the things is pervasive of, of, across the world today is that people in our society have accepted the fact that people deal with addictions and that, you know, the, the medical society has deemed it a, you know, a, a disease. So since it's a disease, it's, 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 it's okay, it's more acceptable, it doesn't have that stigma. So certainly, for example, you may have what we call functioning alcoholics and addicts, right? Who are working in every segment of, of our society, employed, right? Who probably could use going to treatment right now, but they are called functioning. They get to work on time, they're not doing anything at work, but yet they still may be carrying this disease in them and they just haven't gotten to the place where they need help. Well, with this particular, uh, uh, disease that I'm dealing with, it's uh, it's detectable, right? All I got to do is medical exam, and they're going to see that what I'm dealing with, right? And so, therefore, it could prejudice me against um, uh, gaining employment, gaining life insurance. So, prior to Obamacare, I didn't have a shot of getting insurance because I fell under that pre-existing. I could always be, I could always be uh, denied. Because of that, so that was the that was the that's the difference down the middle there. If if I have a disease of alcoholism, right, and and, and or, or substance abuse, I can still work, I can still function, I can still earn a paycheck, right. All I got to do is be a cash drug test, right. And so and, and you know, think about it. Uh, you know, our um, we, we just live, we just legalized marijuana in the state of Nevada. So the bottom line is people can work; they just can't be impaired while they're working. But outside of that, they can do they want to do the most in the color of the So, so it's, it's two, it's, it's, a, it's two different points here. Okay, so I was, uh, I was asked to go to by my nephrologist to do an optic test, and she didn't explain exactly what it was. But if you think about it in the simplest terms, it is actually what my options are. So I walked in, and with reluctance, I went to the, to the options class because there was a time that I kept saying, "I'm not going to go to the machine. I don't want to go to the machine." Out of ignorance, because all I had is a, a point of reference of my mother tied to this machine. So. 
So lo and behold, I uh, talked to a nurse at my uh, nephrologist's office, and she asked me, do I have any family, do I have any relatives? Essentially, she was asking me, do I have any reasons to live? And I said, yes, I have kids, I have daughters, I love them, we have great relationships. And yes. So she said, go to the Oxford class, because, you know, what your mother experienced and what the technology we have today is different. So I did. I went to the optional class, and lo and behold, I got a life education about what I'm truly living with now. So one of the one of the options that they gave us, one of the first options, and these are just options, all three of them, is that I could do three different types of dialysis. I could do it at home, I could do it at a facility, and or there's three options. I can't remember exactly the third one. But that's an option. She said people living a very long time. In other words, they live in a lifetime going back. It's just that, you know, you've got to stay close to the facility. Of course, you can travel and blah, blah, blah. But that's nonetheless an option. And you get a quality of life, energy levels are up, and blah, blah, blah. And so the next option, she said, is called, it's called a kidney transplant. So she, and she, and she made sure she told us that it wasn't a cure. It's just an option. But what that gives you is the ability to live a, a normal life, right? And uh, you're just, you don't have the infamy of the fortune machine that they have, you know, one that's functional. And then the last one was called hospice. And so, as she said, with the hospice option, so when you go into renal failure, um, that, um, so your body becomes toxic and um, you leave this planet within two weeks or two months. So when she said that, it became so real to me of what I'm truly living with and have been living with. And um, certainly, I said, with well, other doctors, to be what I would be very much be interested, be interested in. So having the nephrologist I have, she was very astute in this field of, of study for her and practice. Um, her entire purpose with me was always to go for a transplant. She thought that would be a better option for me. Um, she said, you're still young, um, you work, you, know, you contribute to society, um, a productive member of society, actually, mm -hmm. and um, you would be well suited for that. Um, you're not diabetic, you're not high, you have high blood pressure, so it would actually it would be a good option you know, for you. So the objective is to stay on top of all of my uh, lab work to see you know, what my condition is and um, prepare myself for a uh, transplant. So we, at, you know, in come consulting with her, my nephrologist, we have elected to go the transplant direction or that route. And so what that means is I'm actually going through that process right now, which means I have a hospital, and then uh, uh, they didn't. They're doing what's called a transplant evaluation on me, and I have to go through a litany of medical tests and examinations. Pass those. Uh, they re they require, for example, even believe it or not, uh, you go and get a transplant. You have to hang out, you know, stay at the hospital, close to the hospital for like a month. So I would actually. You know, have to be living near the hospital. Right now, I'm working with I'm working with Cedar Sinai right now in Beverly Hills, and it's and and, 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 and interesting enough, that's and they work with my insurance, so that's pretty so that I can go. So I would have to stay in Los Angeles for a month because I need to be close to the hospital, and that's just part of it. So actually, one of the things that, that I have to secure is actually a couple of uh, um, caregivers because I, I have to stay there. They don't want to allow me to drive or anything like that. Understand that the operation is like four to six hours, something like that, and, um, and you're up and walking the next day. It's just that, uh, and you're 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 actually utilizing that kidney the next day, the new kidney the next day, because that's a function, right? And and then um, and then um, but you have to stay close to the hospital because you're anti rejection medications, which compromise your immune system the rest of your life, right? But um, but they have medications, again, to suppress that and to keep it functional very well. I don't know what the national average is, but some people have, you know, they're living 15 to 20 years longer than if they didn't, you know, have that, you know. 
Now, obviously, like you said, like I was shared earlier that, you know, dialysis people live in, you know, a long time, you know, way past the 15, 20 years mark, right? But again, that, you know, I don't know the lifespan of a new kidney, but, um, you know, 15, 20 years, that type of thing. There are people in their lifetime who have gotten multiple transplants. So you could get, theoretically go back in for another one. I believe um, when you're 75 years old, they don't, they, they just go straight dialysis at 75 and older. They, you got, they don't look to do transplants after 75. It's just dialysis at that point. Uh, I am not listed yet, actually. I'm, wait, I'm, I'm just about to get listed. I've gone through, again, the litany of tests and examinations. We're waiting for the results to come through just to make sure that I am a viable candidate for that um, transplant. Back, uh, back in March of last year, 2015, I was on a work trip in, in Sacramento, and uh, my numbers had, um, my functionality, kidney function numbers dropped from from like 20 down to 18, which meant that I could be listed now. So my nephrologist said, we, I'm going to send you to get evaluated. And um, so I, I know, I just, had, I just I shared it with my younger daughter. She's like 25 years old. I just shared it with her. I, my my uh, oldest daughter, I just hadn't talked to her yet. And so, lo and behold, uh, my, my oldest daughter called me. And we were just, uh, just having a, a normal conversation. And then she just wanted to update what was going on with me. And so I updated what I was going on. And, uh, and so my, my oldest daughter um, basically floored me. Um, and she said, Daddy, I want to um, get tested to be a living daughter for you. And I have to tell you, I didn't know what to do with that because, like, she's my daughter. And um, I know she's, you know, she was, she was about six months out from getting married. She wants to have children. And um, I think about her life. I was, I was thinking about, you know, does she have the, the hereditary disease herself? You know, that type of thing. But, you know, I didn't know even how to say thank you. I didn't, she's, she wants to help sustain my life. I mean, and, and it was just such an amazing... Um, that was such an amazing um, gesture of uh, graciousness and generosity coming from my daughter, you know, and, um, and I'm just so grateful for that. And so um, I, I end up sharing my story a little bit with a, a dear friend here in, in, in Las Vegas. And, um, and then she said she wanted to um, be a, um, a living donor as well. And I've actually you know, just share my story with a few other people. And it was, it was to my amazement and, and just great thankful, you know, they say, Earl, you've touched so many lives. You, you, you help a lot of people. You deserve this. And I've had, you know, two more people say that they would um, volunteer as living donors as well. So I'm just, uh, I'm just really fortunate. I'm really grateful that people think enough of me to want to do that. I'm just grateful. There's some different um, caveats that I found out about this whole kidney um, transplant plant donor um, networking. It's, it's, it's absolutely amazing. Like, for example, if, I'm, if, I, if I can share with you, like, for example, as a living donor herself, right, um, if she does something like that and, and, and donates to me, if she would ever need to be a living donor, automatically she would be at the top of the list. As a living donor, so they they she would get a lot of um, a generosity thrown her way. And what you know was what was interesting as well is that I was informed that let's just say hypothetically that hers did not work and or whoever hers didn't work, but she was a donor. They would actually go through the network, which is a national donor network, and to find a more perfect match. Even if hers match, and there was one that was better, they would literally there would be like a network of people that would be a recipient of that just to make sure we got the best match that would give me the best chance to actually, um, you know, function, to work. Or go down the line to someone that needs it, because she, she's the donor. In order for me to get the, get one, that, that, you know, that type of thing. The tests actually haven't started because I am not on the list yet. So I will be, I believe, in the next few weeks, that will be determined. Um, CETA does it every Thursday. They, um, I mean, it could have happened today, I don't know. But... Um, they, uh, they, I go before a panel of about 20 to 25, well, excuse me, 25 to 30 clinicians, which include uh, social workers, nurses, surgeons, 
the nephrologists, and it's just a big group of these uh, dietitians, that group, to, to, to make sure that I am a good match. Excuse me, not a good match, that, I'm a, that I am a viable candidate for this surgery. They look at just social life. When I say social life, you know, are you, believe it or not, are you working? Do you have insurance? All, the whole, all those things play a pivotal part in it. Yes, I mean, it just, it's, it, it's, it's, the pro it's the process, right? And so there's a lot of factors that go on it, like, you know, are you active? Are you, are you even, like, again, are you working? Yeah, I mean, every, every doctor I'm into, are you working? Are you working? Essentially, you know, are you contributing to society here? Even here in Las Vegas, I've, I've at every specialist I've been to, what do you do for a living? So, um, and, and quite frankly, uh, I asked the doctor, I said, doctor, why do you guys ask that question? I'm just curious. And they, and they, they, they want to know if you are a productive member of society. You know, what is it you do? So, and I was like, wow, that, that plays a part in it. So when they looked at me, for example, and I've had many doctors say, they said, Earl, oh, you're working, you, you, you do good work, you, can, you contribute to our society, you're actually a valuable member of society. And, and those things actually count. I had no idea. It was absolutely amazing. If I share my story, I just like people to know that uh, organ donorship is very vital to our society at large. And I don't believe that there has been enough education and stereotypes and stigmas that, that, that are uh, pervasive with that, you know, people have religious apprehensions, belief apprehensions about organ donorship. And, um, you know, when we, when we go to renew our driver's license, however often we do that, we ask if we want to be donors. And there's so many opportunities that we as human beings can help, help other people. And, but we don't know we can do that. Some people don't have any idea that they can, in fact, live with one kidney. But they can. Your body doesn't actually need to. You have to. Some people are actually born with one. But your body is so um, amazing that it, it adapts to the one. Right? So that's, so, uh, and again, so edu educating people about, about, about this disease, um, talking about the fact that you don't have to be ashamed of it, you know, and uh, that there are also options for us, that we don't have to concede to the fact that we're going to die. So we can live a fulfilled life um, with polycystic kidney disease. You know, there's a big organization called PPD that's out there that's trying to bring awareness. You know, you have, for example, and we've seen this, where we have celebrities who, you know, run into situations and, you know, they're, and granted, there are people who have been listed for a lot of years and wait lists are very long, you know, very long, you know, and they're, you know, people can live, they don't have to die. However, it, it's in, in a lot of instances, it will take people, other human beings, donating their organs to help sustain other people's lives. And so I think that's, a, a, you know, a generous, noble thing to do. Of course, it takes, you know, thought, it takes, um, I mean, obviously, you don't you don't do something like for a whim, like you give away an organ, but think about the connectedness of what it would do, what it does, and not only to that person that you would be donating to, but the residual effects it has, all the other people that it impacts, and I'm not just talking about their family members as well, because all of us have our family, we love our family, we interact with our family, but on a daily basis. Look at the lives that we, that we intersect with every day, and these are people we work with, these people we go to school with. So our life is made up so much more. Our individual community is huge. When we think about all the people we've interacted with from the time we've been on this planet, and all the lives that we've touched, right? So, so this impacts everyone. It's a large group of people that are actually impacted.